What's up everyone, Alex here. This is my JRPG shopping guide for 2022. I'm making this video because I've been in your shoes. Every single time holidays come around and I get some extra money to spend, I forget which games came out this year that I probably missed. So I'm making this video so that you'll know what came out and which games to actually pay attention to when it comes to these sales. In addition to that, I'm going to be helped by three of my favorite content creator friends in this video with their own choices. So I hope you look forward to that one. We have a lot to cover, so let's just get right into it. 2022 has been a fantastic year for tactical RPGs, so I figured one of the best ways to start this list is Tactics Ogre Reborn. This is the third re-release of this game, having been released on PS1, PSP, and now on modern platforms, after its initial release on the Super Famicom back in the 90s. Tactics Ogre Reborn is an uncompromising game, one that rewards loyal and diligent players who take the time to learn its massive systems. I can hardly say that it's a beginner's game, unless you're willing to pour through videos and engage in conversations and chats about all of its systems. And mind you, I'm not sliding the game here. Let's just say that this is a truly one-of-a-kind experience, and veterans of the game who played through its different iterations will attest that it's one of the cream of the crop when it comes to games in the genre. Tactics Ogre Born is available on Switch, PS4, PS5, and PC. I've always been a fan of bite-sized RPGs, and Jack Move is certainly one of them, clocking in at about 10 to 15 hours. Jack Move features a solo protagonist named Noah who's on her quest to save her father from an evil megacorporation. Jack Move features a progression system that's heavily inspired by Final Fantasy VII, and it's got really good game feel when it comes to its battles as well. Jack Move is available on PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Soul Hackers 2 has been constantly updated since its original release. In fact, the game just got a new dash feature, a way to speed up battles, and a few new demons as well. Soul Hackers 2 is not Persona or SMT, but it's a game that's trying to forge a different direction in the series. Unlike SMT or Modern Persona, its cast is made up primarily of working adults, who will appeal to folks who want a shift from the usual student-led stories that have historically dominated those franchises. Soul Hackers 2 is available on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X and S, and PC. Hi guys, TKN here, and my recommendation for 2022 is going to go to Atelier Sophie 2. This game is one of the most chill games you're going to play, perfect for those days when you're dragging your feet and lazing about on the couch after Christmas dinner. But enough about me. Atelier Sophie 2 follows on from the original Mysterious trilogy, but is actually the second game chronologically in that sub-series. Despite that though, I still think people can start here, as story is generally not the focus of Atelier games anyway. In here, Sophie and Plakta are drawn into a dreamlike world where they must work with the citizens of Erda Vigo to eventually escape. Escape. As in most Atelier titles, the gameplay loop is as simple as it gets. Go out, explore, fight some enemies here and there with its engaging turn-based battle system, and then take your spoils back to the Atelier to create ever more powerful equipment. And it's the crafting that truly sets all Atelier games apart from their JRPG contemporaries. It's simple to grasp, but difficult to master, as more mechanics are gradually added allowing you to make even stronger variants of the same items. And it becomes addicting in many respects. Atelier as a series isn't for everyone, but for those it does hooking, it is worth every penny. Thanks TKN. You can find the Kiseki Nut in the link shown or on youtube.com slash the Kiseki Nut. Atelier Sophie 2 is available on Switch, PS4, and PC. I've always been a fan of Omega Force's work on the Warriors games, especially the ones that are set in other universes. Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes builds upon the knowledge they've learned over the years and delivers an action experience that feels like it squarely fits in the universe of Three Houses. And while many hardcore fans of the latter are quick to complain about the fact that it's not Three Houses, or it's not turn-based, or the characters don't act the same, fans who want to spend more time with these characters will find a lot to love in Three Hopes. It also helps that it translates as much of the mechanical depth of Three Houses into its gameplay, making it one of the deepest Warriors games to date. Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes is available on the Nintendo Switch. It's very easy to judge a book by its cover, especially given how the Crossbell games are about a decade old. 
so I was pleasantly surprised when I played through Trails from Zero. By having a story confined to a singular location, it became really easy to be absorbed by its story, locale, and gameplay. And the gameplay is fast and snappy, far better than the Cold Steel quadrilogy, in my opinion. And the story and characters are so well done that it became really difficult to pry away from the game. It's one of those games that when you start it, you'd want to see it the whole way through. Trails from Zero is out on PS4, Switch, and PC. Harvestella is Square Enix take on life sim RPGs. Admittedly, it's more of an action RPG with farming and crafting gameplay rather than the other way around, but you're really going to have to engage with its crafting so that you can survive these deep, deep dungeons. That said, its depth lies more in its storytelling than any other aspect, and you'd be surprised because it actually has much, much deeper storytelling and character development than games like Rune Factory or Stardew Valley. And before you ask, yes, there is romance. Harvestella is out on Switch and PC. What's going on, everyone? My name's Taylor, and I'm from the channel The Gaming Shelf, where I talk about all things Japanese role-playing games. And my suggestion for this year is The Diofield Chronicle. Now, this is a brand new franchise from Square Enix, and a lot of people relate it to Growlancer because it's a real-time strategy RPG. Now, what makes it unique, and why would I want to recommend it? Well, for one, like I said, the gameplay is relatively unique. There are not a lot of games that play out like this. It's essentially a series of many strategy battles where you have to go capture points or fight different enemies, but you have to think about your party's unique combat abilities and how you want to activate them and wait for all their cooldowns. So it's a series of like micro strategy decisions that just make for really fun gameplay moments. And while the visuals aren't AAA by any means, I feel like they're really unique and have a really cool style to them. Not to mention when it gets into story cut scenes, there's a lot of little particles and atmospheric effects that are going on that make it look really cool and unique and unlike anything I've seen in a game really. Now in terms of the story, it's your standard affair when it comes to strategy RPGs. Essentially there's warring kingdoms and the one that you're a part of, well there's a resource there that everybody wants so you're kind of trying to, you know, form alliances and fight off the invading kingdoms. For the most part, to me, it's kind of bog standard for these types of games, so I didn't find that all that interesting. Now, what is interesting is kind of how the game flips a little bit. At the beginning, the combat is interesting, and it seems like there's a lot of potential, but after a while, it gets a little stale and doesn't really do anything new through the end of the game. However, when it comes to the story, the game gets more interesting as the game goes on, so it's kind of like the gameplay and the story enjoyment level kind of flip around. And to me, what makes the game super interesting is the character, Walter Quinn. Now, at first, she seems like this prim and proper princess who's just kind of trying to survive and do her own thing. And without giving too much of the story away, I'll say that Walter Quinn is kind of this spark of chaos that makes the story super fascinating. And all I wanted to see was what she would do next. And that was kind of what kind of drove me through to the end of the game. Not to mention there's some really crazy stuff that happens at the very end. So if the story seems kind of bland, just hang on because it gets way better by the end. And I think something that the Diofield Chronicle does really well is it always keeps you intrigued with something different to do. Now, the battles themselves don't take very long, like maybe five, six, seven minutes, depending on if you have the fast forward feature on and how good you are at the combat. So you blast through a mission real quick, but then when you come back to your base, there's always a side mission to take on, a character conversation to partake in, something to level up in the quest tree or whatever. It, it, there's always something going on and it never takes a terrible amount of time. It's like, you know, 10 minutes at most. So you can always hop from one thing to the next to the next. And the other thing that I love at as a busy adult is that it doesn't take up a lot of your time. It's not very demanding. I ended up getting the platinum trophy, meaning I did everything this game had to offer. And I think it only took me like 25 to 30 hours tops. So, you know, if you're pressed for time like me, you're busy, but you want something a little bit unique and different with a really compelling story, definitely check out the Diofield Chronicle. Thanks, Taylor. You can find the Gaming Shelf's channel on the link shown or on youtube.com slash the gaming shelf. Diofield Chronicle is out on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, and PC. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 has a crazy seven party member battle system and a story that'll take you places, both literally and figuratively. One of the things that I love about the Xenoblade series is that it always has gorgeous environments and a wonderful score that is really heart-wrenching at times. 
it's a one-two punch of JRPG goodness, and I would quickly say that it's a must-have game for 2022. It also makes for a very good reason why you should get a Switch if you haven't yet, because it's only on the Nintendo Switch. Live Alive is a very experimental JRPG that is now available for the first time in the West. Live Alive features multiple scenarios, with different gameplay scenarios that utilize the form and function of JRPG gameplay. Its story might seem a little disjointed due to how vast and varied the stories and eras are, but it comes together quite well at the end. It's also quite divisive, as it still retains much of its mechanics from the original. I see it more as a historical game, given how much of the elements learned from making this were used to make a small game called Chrono Trigger. You probably heard of it. Live Alive is only available on the Nintendo Switch. We've all seen the memes and chaos, but despite the game looking a bit muddy on current gen consoles, I experienced this on PS5 and PC and I love it. A lot of people compare it to Neo and Souls games, but to me, it features something important that those two games don't, which is easier co-op gameplay. Yes, you don't have to pick up silly items to allow you to be summoned in your friend's games. You just make a lobby and jump right in. And you can even help in one another's games too and play as different members of the party. That said, it is still a tough game to play though, and it ain't easy. But I personally had a blast playing this game. I'm also a really huge fan of Final Fantasy 1, and this game has very strong ties to that. So if you want to experience the chaos, Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origins is out on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X and S, and PC. Another series that falls in the category of shorter RPGs is the Voice of Cards series. The Voice of Cards games all may look the same, but each game has introduced new mechanics and gimmicks that are worthy of being their own game. For example, Beasts of Burden is like Pokemon, where you capture monsters and have them fight as part of your party, and The Forsaken Maiden is more of a traditional style JRPG with a heavier emphasis on freedom of travel. I should also point out that this is produced by Yoko Taro, who's responsible for the Nier series, so you can expect these sort of heart-wrenching moments that are just built into the storytelling. Voice of Cards, Beasts of Burden, and The Forsaken Maiden is out on PS4, Switch, and PC. I have been playing Triangle Strategy a lot recently, on two platforms if I might add, and I'm inclined to say that this is one of the best games of the year. There are a lot of quality of life features that makes a seemingly impenetrable genre of tactical RPGs a lot more approachable. This is done by creating an experience that is inspired by many prior tactical RPGs, and then blending that with modern conveniences. Its approach to get people into the genre is very, very different from Fire Emblem Three Houses, which is another popular Switch tactical RPG in that it features elements of the genre, such as differences in elevation and weather changes, that are present in classical tactical RPGs. And despite its politically charged story, its great characters make it feel really exciting. And I will say that I don't normally like political stories, but the characters are so memorable that it's difficult not to get engrossed in the storyline. And of course, play through the game because you can make different choices that actually affect the ending. I'm really curious which ending you'll get if you pick up this game. Triangle Strategy is out on Switch and PC. Hi there, this is David over on the channel David Vink. And if I were to recommend one game for you to buy this year, it would easily be Star Ocean The Divine Force. This is the sixth mainline entry in the long-running series, and while this franchise hasn't had the best reputation in the past decade, The Divine Force seeks to clear that up by going back to the basics, back to what worked. Now, you have dual protagonists to choose from, multiple, massive worlds to explore, super fun quick combat that takes place right on the screen and the ability to soar off to lofty heights or blindside your enemies in battle with the power of the Duma. Then there's references to the previous games in the series, with character cameos found in the addicting minigame Asoa, a pretty looking and unannoying Welch, and even a sickness ravaging the planet just like we saw in the first game. And of course, our heroes are violating that useless, underdeveloped planet protection treaty. 
The entire game just serves as a love letter to fans of the series. And if you are a fan of old school RPGs or action RPGs, or even fully open explorable worlds, such as those found in the Xenoblade series, I do implore you to check this one out. Thanks, David. You can find David's channel in the link shown or on youtube.com slash David Vink. Star Ocean The Divine Force is out on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X and S, and PC. One game series that I literally bought as soon as I made this list is the Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters. I only had six at the very beginning, but because it's on sale, I actually bought the rest of the games because I said, why not? The graphics of the Pixel Remasters might have invoked a mixed reaction on people, but I personally like them. What I also like a lot are the reorchestrations of classic songs, making me want to replay through all of the games. Well, maybe not two. That was pretty rough the first time around. Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters are available on PC and mobile, though I will recommend that you get it on PC because the mobile versions do not support controllers, for some weird reason. The jokes of Persona 5's release on other platforms went on for a good while, didn't it? Until it was announced that it would be released on other platforms. Persona 5 Royal is the definitive turn-based JRPG experience that brings back many classical elements of Shin Megami Tensei, but with modern twists. It fires on all cylinders, from its unique and flashy art direction to the jazz pop soundtrack from Shoji Meguro. If you've never played this game, this is an immediate must-play. Persona 5 Royal is out on PS4, PS5, Switch, Xbox One, Series X and S, and PC. And it's also on Game Pass and Xbox Cloud Gaming. The following games are going to be out pretty soon after this video comes out, but I want you all to be aware of them because I've been following the news surrounding these games for quite a while, and I have a really good feeling that they're going to be great. So let's check them out. Chained Echoes. I actually have a preview for this game. It's coming out on December 8th on PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion is coming out on December 13th on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, and PC. And that, my friends, are 20 must-buy JRPGs of 2022 that I highly recommend picking out. I also want to take the time to thank The Gaming Shelf, The Kiseki Nut, and David Vink for providing their entries in this video. On behalf of my friends, I hope you enjoy the games that you pick up from this list. If you do decide to pick up any of these games, or maybe want to watch a review of mine, you'll find these in the pinned post of this video. And I can't wait to read your comments and reactions, and maybe your personal endorsements of some of the games on this list. But I want to hear what you think. Any games here that you'd personally endorse? Any games here that you want to play? Post your thoughts in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.